caves are magical places full of amazing sights. The mineral deposits that adorn cave ceilings and walls are intricate and incredibly varied, consisting of stalactites, stalagmites, curtains, frozen waterfalls, rimstone dams, and the most remarkable of all cave formations, helictites. And every one of them has been sculptured by nothing more than water. Caves themselves are also created by water. The tunnels, chambers, shafts, and finely sculptured walls have all been carved out by flowing water. So, how do caves come into existence? The story of caves begins around 400 million years ago, when the earth was largely covered by sea. Caves, or at least the caves illustrated in this film, are formed from a sedimentary rock called limestone. The limestone beds from which caves were formed were laid down on the seabed, and they consist of the skeletons of countless billions of marine animals. The different layers or beds represent either a change in climatic conditions or an interruption in sedimentation. When these sediments called limey ooze were buried under others, they became compacted. Later, mineralised waters percolated through them and minerals precipitated into the pore spaces cementing everything together to form solid rock. This process is called diagenesis. Over the next several million years, movements in the plates that make up the Earth's crust cause many of the limestone beds to be lifted up and left high and dry. The enormous forces which move the rocks cause them to distort into downfolds called synclines and upfolds or anticlines. The pressure on the rock layers cause them to crack and this cracking is essential for caves to develop in the limestone beds. It's now time for a short chemistry lesson. Limestone is a chemical compound called calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is insoluble. When raindrops fall, they react with the carbon dioxide in the air to form a weak acid called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid reacts with limestone to form a new compound called calcium hydrogen carbonate. And calcium hydrogen carbonate is soluble. And that quite simply is how caves are made, by the action of carbonic acid dissolving limestone. The major period of cave development was from about 2 million years ago to around 10,000 years ago. The carbonic acid derived from falling rain through the atmosphere is extremely weak, and most of the acidity is added in the soil and the peat layers covering the limestone, by the decomposition of organic matter and microbial respiration releasing CO2. This diagram shows water making its way underground, dissolving the limestone rock on its journey. The different beds are separated from each other by bedding planes. Bedding planes are lines of weakness within the rock. The vertical cracks are called joints, and if a joint passes through more than one bed, it is called a master joint. Initially, cave passages are formed underwater first by the rock being dissolved along a joint or bedding plane, and then by mechanical action as bits of sand and grit, and then stones carried by the water, scour the cave walls. Phreatic tubes are cave passages formed completely underwater. As they are completely submerged passages, the cave walls are dissolved uniformly in all directions, forming a tube. This rather cosy phreatic tube is the long crawl in Danny Rogoff, a cave in South Wales, and this is the bedding plain around which the cave passage formed. Here is another example of a phreatic tube, much larger this time. It is the mainstream passage in Peak Cavern, Derbyshire. It's about seven metres in diameter, and believe it or not, it is completely natural. Again, you can see the bedding plain around which this passage has developed. 
When water levels fall and the passage is no longer completely filled, the stream is left flowing along the floor, just like you have seen in the main stream passage in Peak Cavern. The acid water can now only erode the floor, and it carves a trough in the bottom of the phreatic tube. This is called the Vado stage of cave development. Here is an example of a Vado's trough. Can you see the original phreatic tube and the bedding plane around which the tube developed? As the Vado's trough gets cut deeper and deeper, a keyhole shaped passage is formed, with a stream flowing at the bottom of a deep rift. Here is an example of a keyhole passage. Jessie's head and torso are clearly in the original phreatic tube and her legs are in the Vado's trench. These photographs were taken in Ogof Ear Arth. In the left hand photo, Chris is walking in the stream at the bottom of a narrow keyhole passage. In the right hand photo, the shape of the keyhole passage can clearly be seen. Chris has climbed up into the phreatic zone and below the stream is continuing to erode a deeper slot in the keyhole. This photograph also shows another feature of cave development called phreatic shelving. The layers of the limestone beds can clearly be seen. Different beds have different hardnesses, so some erode more quickly than others. The harder beds are left as shelves on the cave wall, when softer beds between them are more quickly eroded away. Some of the best examples of phreatic shelving can be seen in this short stream cave in South Wales called Ogof Clogwin. Phreatic tubes can become so large that the roof can no longer support its own weight. Sections will break away and fall to the floor. This will continue to happen until a very dense and stable bed of limestone is reached. So these breakdown chambers are characterised by their flat ceilings. Here is an example of a breakdown chamber. And it's sobering to think that all of the thousands of rocks that litter the floor were once part of the cave roof. Here is another example. A stream is still flowing through the boulders in this passage, gradually eroding them away. Evidence of the original phreatic tube is still discernible, as well as differential erosion of the various limestone beds. Notice also the characteristic flat ceiling. Finally, you will see that stalactites are growing along cracks in the ceiling. Here is another cave feature. You will have spotted that it's a breakdown chamber with a characteristic flat roof and boulder strewn floor, but in the floor is a shake hole. Shake holes, or sinkholes as they are often called, are formed when a void underground collapses. Shake holes are a surface feature which often indicate cave development below, but this is a shake hole within a cave and was created by a cave passage below collapsing. And this is the passage below. It was imaginatively named by those who discovered it Boulder Chamber. Cavers call this a boulder choke. The original explorers knew that if they could find a way through it, there would be more cave on the other side. They did find a way through it and discovered one of the largest cave systems in the UK with almost 50 kilometres of cave passage. Have you ever played Kaplunk? You know the game where you gently pull out the sticks and hope that the marbles won't fall. Well getting through a boulder choke for the first time is like playing a human version of Kaplunk. The cavers gently remove boulders to try and make a route through and hope that the boulder they removed wasn't supporting anything and that the choke won't collapse. Here's a short video showing what it's like to go through one of these boulder chokes. The way into the choke is on the right before the passage closes down. The route through is complex but polished. This navigational obstacle in the cave is often responsible for rescue callouts when cavers cannot find their way through and exit the cave. This large choke requires cavers to undergo a number of contortions on their way through its jumble of boulders. But caves are not just boulders, rocks, passages and chambers. 
they are also incredibly beautiful places and the same water that creates a cave is also responsible for decorating it. I'm sure everyone knows about stalactites and stalagmites and also which is which, but how are they formed? Stalactites are formed when water rich in calcium hydrogen carbonate drips through a crack in the roof of a cave passage. While a drop of water is hanging from the ceiling, a few molecules of calcium carbonate, also called calcite, crystallise out and form a ring around the outside of the drop. This happens with every drop that forms and over thousands of years a hollow straw stalactite is formed. I've seen straws over three metres long. They are so fragile that one dares not breathe near to them. If the drip rate is very slow then water can spread out along the cave roof and a cone shaped stalactite will form. When the drips of water fall onto the cave floor a stalagmite will form. As the drips splash out sideways stalagmites are usually shorter and fatter than the corresponding stalactites above them. If stalactites and stalagmites are undisturbed they will eventually join up to form a column. This is Cloud Chamber in Danny Rogoff, so named because the profusion of straw stalactites hanging from the ceiling looked like a cloud to the first explorers. There are thousands and thousands of straws in this chamber. Here's what some of them look like close up and you can see that underneath some of them shorter, fatter stalagmites are forming. This photograph was taken in a cave in South Wales called Ogof Fun and Thee. You can see it's a phreatic tube by its arch ceiling. A whole array of stalactites are formed along a crack in the ceiling and many of them have corresponding stalagmites below them. You can see that two of them are well on their way to form a column, but sadly this won't happen in my lifetime. Where water runs down a wall, calcium carbonate will crystallise out. This feature is called flowstone or a frozen waterfall. This is Column Hall in Ogofun and Thee, with these beautiful examples of stalagmite columns reflected in the water. Again you can see it's a phreatic tube, characterised by the arched roof, but there's a little bit of collapse evident on the right hand side. These formations are also in the same cave, they are called the mini columns. They are strange because they are very well developed stalagmites, but there are no corresponding stalactites. For many years it was a complete mystery to me how they could possibly have formed. Recently I've been told that the secret is that they formed relatively rapidly. The drips from the cave roof that led to their formation dripped so fast that there wasn't time for calcite to crystallise out on the roof and form a stalactite. I'm not sure I believe this. I prefer the theory that they are the evidence that we've been visited by aliens. This cave decoration is called a curtain. The Americans call them drapes. Curtains are formed on sloping ceilings as the calcite rich water drips from numerous places. If a powerful light is shone through a curtain it will reveal bands of colour. These show that the water from which the curtain was formed contained different minerals at different periods of time. These formations are called helictites and they grow in all sorts of weird and wonderful directions. There are various theories as to how they form and no one seems to be really sure, but their growth does seem to be influenced by the air movement in the cave as they more often than not all point roughly in the same direction. This formation in Aganathworth in South Wales is a 1.6 metre long stalactite with a corresponding stalagmite, but the stalactite is covered with a profusion of magnificent helictites. And this large mass of jumbled helictites in Ogofdrynan is named the Gerion. These are snotites. Snotites are not stalactites. They are in fact quite disgusting as they flap around in the movement of the air currents as you pass by them. They are actually colonies of bacteria. This photograph was taken in Paris Cop Mine on Anglesey. I believe the atmosphere in the mine is quite acidic and favours the growth of this particular bacteria. Finally, not all cave formations are made from calcite. This is the Swiss village in Aganathweth and it's a mud formation. 
On top of each of the pinnacles is a small stone. When water drips onto the stones it splashes out sideways so the mud is washed away around the stone but not from underneath it, leaving behind this amazing cave formation.